This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. I'm Emma Keeling, finding out if the SARS-CoV-2 virus will become endemic like the flu, or if it will be eliminated with vaccines and herd immunity. I'm Shinny Somara, finding out about metamaterials, understanding what they are and what they can do. And I'm Guy Henderson in Copenhagen, Denmark, where artificial intelligence is being used to catch the early signs of the deadliest form of skin cancer. The coronavirus pandemic has now touched every corner of the world, even reaching as far as Antarctica. But groundbreaking research has produced a range of highly effective vaccines in the space of just a year. Many now believe we're at the beginning of the end, with the vaccine rollout paving the way for a new normal in a post-COVID world. But what does this future look like, and how will it be achieved? It's worth remembering the distinction between the virus SARS-CoV-2 and the disease COVID-19. Coronavirus vaccine trials focused on reducing severe COVID-19 disease in adults. They did not examine whether vaccines prevented SARS-CoV-2 infection. To prevent infection, a vaccine has to induce what is known as sterilizing immunity. This means the immune system prevents the virus from getting a toehold in the body. If a coronavirus vaccine does not produce sterilizing immunity, then a vaccinated person can still be infected with SARS-CoV-2 and risk transmitting it to others. So there are two scenarios for the coronavirus vaccine. One, that it prevents disease but not infection. This reduces hospitalizations and deaths but does not suppress the virus. And two, it prevents disease and reduces infections. This reduces hospitalizations and deaths and suppresses the virus. This has huge implications for the vaccination strategy and the future of the pandemic. If we take the first scenario, that coronavirus vaccines prevent disease but not infection, then SARS-CoV-2 will almost certainly become endemic. This means it will continue to circulate in regions around the world, and we must learn to live with the virus and reduce its harm through targeted vaccination campaigns, like we do now with the flu. There are two key variables in this scenario. How quickly can the virus escape immunity? And how long does vaccine immunity last? We can look to influenza, otherwise known as flu, as an example of an endemic virus. The 1918 influenza pandemic, which killed more than 50 million people, introduced the influenza A virus from birds into humans. Now almost all cases of influenza A descend from that pandemic, which contributes to almost 650,000 deaths from seasonal flu a year. Influenza has similar looking spike-like structures on its surface as with SARS-CoV-2. The virus mutates very quickly, allowing it to sneak past the immune system's defences, which is why we require a new flu jab each year. SARS-CoV-2 does not mutate as fast as influenza, but newly discovered variants may already escape some degree of vaccine immunity. If global cases cannot be suppressed by vaccines, then it's more likely that new variants will require updated vaccines, just like the yearly flu jab. But if immune escape doesn't occur as easily as with influenza, then the second question is how long will SARS-CoV-2 immunity last by either infection or vaccination? One theory is that SARS-CoV-2 may become like the other endemic human coronaviruses, OC43, 229E, NL63 and HKU1, which are responsible for common colds. We are infected by these viruses as children, where we establish a base level of immunity. This wanes over time, meaning that repeated infections occur, but only with mild disease. Whether the potency of COVID-19 will become milder with vaccinated or infected immunity over a longer period of time is still unknown. 
If we return to the second scenario, that is, a vaccine that reduces disease and infections, a strategy of virus elimination may be possible. Key to elimination is vaccine herd immunity. The principle relies on a vaccinated person not being able to transmit or be infected by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Increasing the number of people who cannot be infected or pass on the virus will, at a certain threshold, protect the population as a whole. The threshold of how much of the population needs to be vaccinated to achieve this level of herd immunity depends on multiple factors, such as how transmissible the virus is, what social distancing measures are in place, and how effective the vaccine is at blocking transmission. For SARS-CoV-2, a vaccine that can block almost all transmission will require between 60 to 80% uptake in a population, depending on which model you look at. If the vaccine is only partially effective at blocking transmission, then either 80 to 95% of the population need to be vaccinated. Now, if you factor in vaccine hesitancy, which is on the decline but could be as high as 28% as surveyed in France, and children, for which there are currently no licensed coronavirus vaccines available, then vaccine herd immunity and elimination becomes much more difficult to achieve, or in some cases, impossible. An elimination strategy has been followed for the highly infectious virus for measles. In 1963, an effective vaccine with near-complete sterilizing immunity was developed and rolled out, allowing many parts of the world to eliminate the virus. Although recent vaccine hesitancy has reversed that trend, with deaths from measles increasing 50% from 2016 to 2019. More successful has been the elimination of polio. Of the three polio virus strains, two have been completely eradicated and one is very close. Some argue that a similar elimination strategy could be possible with SARS-CoV-2. A study in the UK, which has yet to be peer-reviewed, found that a single dose of the Pfizer vaccine was effective at reducing COVID-19 and SARS-CoV-2 transmission. If confirmed, it paves the way for a possible elimination strategy for the virus. Alongside this, globally we've become more aware of the measures necessary to reduce respiratory virus transmission. Washing our hands regularly, wearing a mask, ventilating spaces and self-isolating when feeling unwell. For example, in the UK, a combination of these measures and an increased uptake in flu vaccinations has resulted in not a single case of flu being detected this year by Public Health England. This shows there's a lot we can do ourselves, like having regular vaccinations, wearing masks during autumn and winter, and social distancing when outbreaks occur. Because in the long run, eradication may not be possible. You can see more of Razor on our YouTube channel. Search for Razor Science Show and it will take you straight there. Remember to subscribe and hit the bell button for notifications. Life moves pretty fast. Ideas move at the speed of sound. Technology moves at the speed of light. If you don't filter out the noise, you might miss the details. We pay attention to the details because they matter. Showing you a different perspective. See the difference.
What does a Venus flytrap, an earwig's wings and a grasshopper's legs have in common? They're all natural examples of energy being stored in one state and effortlessly changing into another state. What would it take for engineers to develop materials that do the same? We're trying to generate a material that can do pretty cool stuff, but it, it's still simple stuff, but it can do it without almost any intervention. This element has like a two stable states. So you this step in this configuration, also stable in uh, this configuration. So currently uh, this is in uh, all the elements are in one configuration and I can just uh, trigger. Andres Arrieta leads the Laboratory of Programmable Structures at Purdue University. Him and his team are working on something called metamaterials, which are materials that combine the best characteristics of individual materials to form one better material. These kinds of solutions are bringing ingenuity to a variety of industries, including robotics, aviation, and even architecture. The specific um, work that we have been uh, doing on metamaterials is actually uh, trying to generate some properties that we called programmable in the sense that uh, we're able, after the material is being made, we're able to actually significantly change the behavior of it in a controllable way. So can you give me some examples of how you do that? We've been doing that by arranging in a network what we call bistable units. And these units uh, are essentially just like the slab bracelets that perhaps uh, we used to play with when we were uh, young. Like a snap band, a bistable unit is just that, stable in two different configurations. In one state, it has stored energy, in the other, the energy is released, often with a snap. Professor Arietta's team began with a pop-up dome, 3D printed from thermoplastic polyurethane. By pressing with a finger, the dome would snap to become either convex or concave. When they printed a 3x3 grid of these domes, they began to see new behaviours. What we do with connecting them is essentially creating a metamaterial that has many different possible configurations. And each of these shapes has associated to it a different mechanical property. By pressing certain domes in or out, the sheets formed various shapes. The bistable domes combining to form a new metamaterial, which they call hierarchical multi-stability. What's more, the dome-based metamaterial is able to store energy. So every time you uh, switch one of these units from its as-made state to its inverted state, you have to put some energy on it. But that energy is stored in the material, and this is what makes it a, a metamaterial in a way, that you can really significantly alter the, the behavior of this uh, material by playing with the local arrangement of these units. They look really fun to play with, but how can tech like this be useful? We have a bistable gripper that is internally pressurized and then the domes are inverted and then the energy that is saved into those domes and that causes the formation of the gripper, it's then there to hold onto an object without any more provision of energy. The gripper is sprung loaded by the inverted domes to close on an object in response to air pressure in the surrounding environment. Many robots are in certain ways mimicking anthropomorphic constructions or, or some sort of animal construction, but then that means our uh, actuator systems are very localized. So we would have a joint and then there would be an actuator at the joint and this actuator would only really extend our arms or change the angle, etc. But if we could make the arm in a way that it would store some energy, we could do the trick that we did with the gripper of using just one input pressure and just one control input and then generate a complicated reconfiguration. Storing energy in structures is a trick used all the time in nature. 
and Professor Arietta and his team see no harm in stealing some ideas. Insects are very clever in using their exoskeleton and their morphology to, to create functionality. For example, uh, insects use this protein called resilin. And uh, resilin is essentially a very good spring. So they store energy on, on their joints of resilin and then they release them very quickly. And this is one trick that insects use to, for instance, jump very high. So in a similar vein, uh, we see that we can generate storage of energy in, for example, flexible robotics. And then this energy can be released quickly to generate fast movements. This is one application. And uh, we have illustrated that on, on a previous uh, work that we did um, on this insect called the earwig that has an origami-like wing that reconfigures very nicely. The ability of an earwig's wing to quickly spring out from one state to another could be replicated in the designs of robots, packaging, spacecraft and biomedical devices. OK, let me see if I've got this right. Your metamaterials store energy in order to quickly change so that they can respond or adapt to different environments. But how can they be also used to make simple computations? So, of course, the first computers were mechanical. The Abacus is a very simple mechanical computer. If we were able to do some more computation at the edge, actually, the skin of the machine itself or the load carrying structure of buildings or bridges or aircraft, then we would be able to take a lot of the data that is generated by the interaction with the environment and uh, leave the computational power to really do high level decision making. It's not a crazy idea. Professor Arietta and his team studied the Venus flytrap, an example of an organism that's able to perform a simple computation, responding mechanically to stimuli on the hairs inside its trapping mechanism. If you touch two hairs in a small time frame, and the plant doesn't have a brain, doesn't have a neural system um, as we know it, but still this is a computation. The hope is this could be replicated on the surface of an engineered structural robot, pre-programmed to react to external stimuli and computing a simple movement, saving energy and computational power coming from elsewhere. So if we could leverage these properties of metamaterials in terms of their ability to reconfigure, to change their properties and even to conduct some simple computations, we would see machines that will have some something akin to reflexes and something akin to instinct that would um, allow them to respond quickly and hence be able to operate in more chaotic environments and allow us to concentrate our resources to then create better performing machines by simplifying this complexity of the world. For more science, behind-the-scenes insights, groundbreaking research and even some fun, check out our Razor podcast. Search Razor Sounds on all major streaming platforms and remember to subscribe so you don't miss out on any episodes. Whether it's about your education, the home you live in, or the items you buy, your money has a story to tell. Because every business story is a human story. Global Business. When you think about space, you probably imagine a vast, pristine void. You think, space. But the area closest to Earth, known as Low Earth Orbit, is actually littered with junk. Defunct satellites, discarded rocket stages, and debris from collisions and explosions. There are estimated to be nearly a million items of orbital debris larger than one centimetre, 
reaching up to 15 kilometers per second, 10 times faster than a bullet. Even the smallest of these could penetrate the shields of the International Space Station's crew modules. More than 28,000 objects larger than 10 centimeters are tracked from Earth. At this size, they could shatter a spacecraft. The amount of space junk is rising rapidly. The ISS had to reposition three times in 2020 to avoid collisions with debris. If this trend continues, it could trigger the Kessler Syndrome, a catastrophic chain reaction of collisions rendering some orbits unusable. As the zone is occupied by crewed space stations, missions en route to deeper space and most of the satellites that provide cell phone reception, internet, GPS, weather forecasting and more, the impact would be vast. So what can be done? Special spacecraft fitted with nets, harpoons, robotic arms or lasers might offer a solution for deorbiting larger items, but these missions are likely to be complex, expensive and risky. In the long term, it would make sense to reduce the amount of junk that gets there in the first place. Ideas include attacks on launches and charging fees for the duration of a satellite's time in orbit. Eventually, all spacecraft should be able to deorbit themselves if we are to avoid our nearest region of space becoming a no-go zone for future generations. Skin cancer is on the rise. Catch it early enough and this is how you treat it. A relatively simple procedure under local anaesthetic. Leave it too long and things can get more complicated. By far the most dangerous form of skin cancer is called melanoma. It spreads to other organs fast and that makes early detection all the more important. I'm Guy Henderson in Copenhagen, Denmark where artificial intelligence is being used to help do just that. It is the depths of winter here, so there's little chance of overexposure to the sun, which is thought to be the prime cause of melanoma. Still, you can't be too careful when it comes to cancer. trip to doctors like plastic surgeon Inanna Weiss for a good old-fashioned checkup remains the only way to confirm or relay a patient's concerns. What are you looking out for? So I'm looking at the structure, at the amount of pigment and if it's regular or irregular. Um, there are certain uh, alarm signals that you look, look for. Uh -huh. I will show you a slide. I actually have a pretty good diagram I can show you that depicts it okay. in a more understandable fashion. So okay. this also, to me, does not look dangerous. Okay. And while I'm at it, I'm looking at the one you have on your earlobe here as well, on your ear. So I'm getting a free yes. checkup now. You are, actually. Perfect so everything looks perfectly fine. Okay, well, that's a relief. But uh, you asked me a question of what, to want, what you have to look at. For. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, if how... you come over here, I actually have a chart. Uh, which is generally accessible. And this is what's called the ABCDE of detecting melanoma. So okay. the first row shows normal nevuses, normal birthmarks, normal spots on your body. And you see they're all they're symmetrical, the border is well-defined, the color is homogenous, the diameter is rather small, and they're not changing. If you look at the melanoma slides below, you see that this one is asymmetrical, the borders are uneven. It has multiple colors. So remember I said earlier that the pigmentation was homogenous, that it was even? Yes. That's a good thing. Yes. If it's uneven, that's one of the, the things you want to look out for. And now there's a high-tech gadget that can help you keep tabs on them. It's called a mobile phone. So now we have a series of images of his back, as yeah. you can see here. Yeah. And now... This is the office of MySkin, a Danish startup whose app can help catch the early signs of the disease. John Fries is the CEO. 
basically this, this, this is an app, it's a patient consumer technology that helps people identify new things on their skin or changes on their skin. Mm -hmm. This is a, one of the feature set is really focused on a close-up image where you can take several images over time to kind of identify if this mole is, is changing or developing in any way. And then we, we have elements where you have a more holistic view of this and where you take uh, photos of your skin areas, of your body parts, and uh, with some of our technology you can get some support of identifying if new things is coming. 70 to 80 percent of melanoma skin cancer, which is the most dangerous form, is actually forming as a new mark on your skin and not from an existing mole. That is kind of new science. With each new user, the app becomes a more powerful tool. Basically, we're using these images to train machine learning algorithms so they are able to identify these elements you have on your skin. And you say training. Does that mean that they are still in a process of training? This, this is an ongoing process because the more data we get, we can train our algorithms, the better it will be to identify different elements you have on your skin. Unlike many other apps, it does not claim to diagnose. Doctors are saving the life because they identify, they assess the moles, they assess skin cancer, diagnose skin cancer, treat skin cancer. But it's extremely important for the patient to come in and see the doctor in time because there's a very strong correlation with early detection of a change and then early detection of skin cancer and the successful rate of treatment. The MySkin app is the first of its kind that's received some backing from regulators. So Dr. Weiss is now recommending it to patients. So how many of your patients do you recommend this app to? I recommend it to patients who come for a full body checkup who have multiple nevi, who have what is called dysplastic nevi syndrome or who just have lots of spots that are really difficult to evaluate also as a physician. Health experts see the MySkin app as one of the early steps towards a transformation of the health sector. Mark Wolf specialises in the application of advanced and predictive analytics. We went to see this new app, which is able to at least map the skin for uh, the risk of melanoma. Absolutely. But the stress at this stage is this is not, this is not your doctor. This iPhone is no. not, never going to be your doctor. Um, is it never? Or you know, could, do you envisage a day when your phone, for example, would be able to tell? Absolutely. It is simply a function of the amount of information you can feed the machine to teach it. If, if it sees every possible mole and every possible skin lesion that there is, it will then be able to identify which ones are precancerous, which ones are cancerous, and which ones are benign. It's simply really a matter of numbers. But today, the value is really in a sort of data reduction. Let the computer take a look at everything, eliminate what it's 100% confident about, and then leave the human with just a few to look at. And right there, there's value. It's a more efficient approach. It's a kind of data reduction step. But in the end, yes, machines will become quite powerful at diagnosing. Imagine this, though, a world in which not necessarily diagnosis, but certainly early detection, is taking place the whole time. The sensors are there. It's just the apps that are needed. We're only measured when we're sick. The idea now is to measure us when we're healthy. And if you measure people through sensors, through remote technology, uh, using personal devices like, like a smartwatch or a smartphone, we can build into those devices artificial intelligence that is literally monitoring the person while they're healthy. We can teach AI to find early signals of diabetes, congestive heart failure, uh, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and actually alert the clinician much sooner and intervening sooner will cost less, be of benefit to the patient, and produce much more greater long-term value than simply curing. Prevention is indeed still the best cure. <laughs>